he is uh, one of the most prolific and just totally generous and story-loving oral historians I've ever known. But when we're together, we just tell stories to each other all the time, mostly about our children, so that shows how much we love stories. But there's really no way to properly introduce him, so I'm just going to say welcome to our institute for the 26th year, and um, please enjoy. Thank, Thank you. And it's really great to be here again. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, I don't know where to start. Anyway, um, I'm trying to figure out how to. Well, back in. Uh, 1997 it was the middle of the summer, and uh, for some reason I was at home, and uh, I went out to buy a newspaper, and I live across the street from the place where the last uh, Nazi massacre took place in Rome uh, on the 4th of June, 1944. Uh, the um, uh, you know, as the Allies were coming in from the south, the Nazis were running away from the north, uh, which is where I live, and they were carrying away their political prisoners and on trucks. And one of those trucks broke down just right across, right where I live, and uh, so they didn't know what to do with the with the prisoners, uh, and uh, uh, and they killed them. Just uh, they didn't. So and, th and there's a there's a sort of there's a stone uh, on the side of the street with the names, and you know it's one of those things where you walk by and you never notice uh, because it's been there all the time and everything. Uh, however, that morning, uh, as I was going out, and uh, uh, I saw a huge swastika drawn on that stone with the names of the victims. And uh, which was the first time I really noticed the stone. Um, and um, so I did something which uh, you're sort of ashamed of uh, because as Roland Barthes says, uh, we're no longer ashamed of uh, sexuality, we're ashamed of uh, sentimentality. So I went, bought some flowers, and went back to put them by the stone. And by the time I got there, uh, I live in this sort of uh, uh, what we call uh, a middle class dormitory, uh, a neighborhood where middle class people just come to sleep, uh, not a real neighborhood. But before that, it, it used to be sort of a working class area. It's, it's right in the periphery. And suddenly, all the working people came, just seemed to come out of the woodwork and gathered around that stone. And as I got back there with my flowers, um, they were discussing how to erase that, stone, that swastika. And of course, the, uh, the body shop guy says, I have a rotor, I can. And the other, the other guy said, well, You're going to ruin the marble. It's cheap marble, but it's still marble. Uh, you're going to rule the, uh, we can't do that. And somebody from the paint shop said, I have a solvent. We can make, I don't know what they, how they did it. It's gone. But as I was standing there and listening to them discuss uh, what were the professional, the, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. professional means they had to erase the swastika, mm -hmm. I said, what about me? And, um, and I said, maybe the only professional means that I have to erase a swastika is oral history. And uh, this was in the middle of a major court case going on. Uh, just a few months earlier, uh, CBS um, TV crew had located in Argentina this man, Eric Pricke. And Eric Pricke was uh, a captain in the SS in, uh, in 1943, 44, where Rome 
was occupied by the Nazis, and he had been involved in the um, killing of 335 men uh, in a place called uh, Fosse Ardiatina, the Ardiatin Caves. And Ardiatin, the, it's, a, it's a road, it's a road that goes south of Rome. And um, he was extradited to Italy, and, uh, and there was a trial going on. And I had never really done, been very much interested in uh, the history of the war, of resistance, of anti-fascism. Uh, I had been more concerned with the history of the labor movement, uh, steel workers in uh, uh, Italy, coal miners in Kentucky, and things like that. But uh, I had been intrigued at the way in which um, uh, he was, in, he was on, uh, under trial, there was a trial going on, and the newspapers were reporting the on the trial. And the thing that uh, intrigued me there was uh, how the, uh, I mean, this massacre took place in 1944, uh, March 24, 1944. The trial was going on in the spring of 1997, and uh, and these people, the survivors, uh, the wives, the children, were as hysterical as if it had just happened. Uh, they were fainting, they were screaming, they were uh, as if you know the wound was still bleeding. And there was one phrase that uh, intrigued me. Which was uh, one of the new, one of the papers described them as these uh, elderly orphans. And when we talk about orphans, we orphans we usually talk about children. These these people were at least 54, 55 years old. Some, uh, but uh, so I was intrigued by that. And uh, so the the thought that. Uh, the way that I could use to erase the swastika was to work on that memory. And the question uh, to me was not so much reconstructing what happened, reconstructing the massacre. I'll tell you briefly some of the background. But uh, the question was, how did these people live those 54 years uh, with that bleeding open wound? How did they go through life? Uh, because uh, the Foster Desine massacre is one of the traumatic events and controversial events in our history. Um, Rome was occupied by the Nazis in, 19, uh, in September 1943. Immediately, small groups uh, of people started out a guerrilla war, a resistance. Um, that lasted throughout the nine months of the Nazi occupation in Rome. And the most uh, significant episode was the attack that a group of partisans carried out in, in the center of Rome on the 23rd of March. Uh, 16 partisans attacked 120 uh, SS policemen marching to, uh, through the center of Rome. They exploded a TNT charge. They attacked them with uh, hand grenades. And uh, 33 German uh, soldiers, well, they were not soldiers. The, the SS were not soldiers. Uh, uh, 33 uh, members of the SS, SS policemen uh, were killed. The next day, the Nazis, as uh, retaliation, killed. 335 uh, hostages. Um, and there's always been uh, a lot of controversy about this. Uh, in the first place, you know, the question is, there have been worse massacres in, in Italy and in Rome itself. Uh, you may have seen or heard of the not, not very good uh, Spike Lee movie, Miracle at Santana, and it's about a massacre uh, com perpetrated by the Nazis in uh, the mountains of North, uh, 
north east no is that east no northwest uh, uh, Italy <laughs> and where 450 people were killed uh, at another place uh, Marzabotto more than 800 but even in Rome even in Rome if you count that uh, um, at least 900 people were deported at one, from one neighborhood and nobody knows how many came back. If you consider that 2,000 Jews were deported and only maybe about 25 came back. Or if you consider that at least 4,000 people were killed by Allied raids. In the, the, uh, so why does the Foster de Atene uh, have this huge impact? And there are, there's a number of reasons. One is the place where it takes place. I mean, uh, most Nazi massacres took place in Western Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe and Asia is different. But in Western Europe, they took place in rural or semi-rural environments. This is the only Nazi massacre that took place in a major metropolitan city. Uh, not just any city. I mean, Rome had this huge symbolic impact uh, because of its history, because it's the capital of the Catholic Church. So anything happening in Rome has a huge symbolic uh, meaning. Also, uh, because, you know, if you kill 156 people in Civitella Valdichiana, which is a village in, the, in Tuscany, they're more or less socially homogeneous. Uh, it's, you know, the uh, petty bourgeoisie, rural working class of the uh, of a small hill village. But if you kill 335 people in Rome, you have all walks of life. Uh, you have from uh, the from the Piedmont aristocracy, uh, which is the ancestor of the current owner of Ferrari, uh, to uh, Jewish ghetto peddlers, you have teachers, you have lawyers, you have uh, craftspeople, lots of craftspeople. Uh, you have ages go from 14 to 74. Uh, it's the only uh, uh, context in which Jews and non Jews are killed together. Uh, and um, and you have all the, all neighborhoods, but also you have the whole country because Italy, Rome is the capital, so people flocked to Rome in the couple of generations between 1870 when Rome became the capital to 1940. And wherever you go in Italy, you will ha find memories of somebody who was killed there, from Sardinia to Trieste, to, from anywhere. So it's really a national shrine. Uh, the other way that makes it so powerful is the way it was carried out. Because uh, as opposed to other massacres when, you know, uh, well, you, you know, you, you walk around Rome and uh, you look up and you will find, you know, these uh, plaques that say uh, the German barbarism, the barbarity, the ferociousness. This was not a barbarous massacre. Uh, this was a very civilized massacre because in, in other cases, you know, you have a unit of soldiers that just panics, runs amok, kills everything in sight. In this case, it was done in a very orderly manner. Uh, the commander of the SS in Rome sat down in his office, drew a list. Then they had, they had to find a place, uh, which was the, the caves that had been dug to uh, get the material for the building for the uh, for the building of Rome, for all the new neighborhoods in Rome. So they were you know, tunnels under the ground, and uh, you had to have the logistics trucks. You had to have a list. I mean, you had to have modernity, the uh, the, the Western state. I mean, you had to have our civilization not barbarism. And the other thing is there was a huge controversy because uh, there was a myth uh, whereby uh, the story, the, 
the circulator was that after the partisans attacked, uh, the Nazis requested the perpetrators, quote unquote, to turn themselves in or else they're going to kill 310 Italians for each, <coughs> for each German. Uh, Incidentally, even Germans can miscalculate. <coughs> so 33 by 10 does not make 335. Um, and um, uh, this never happened. But there's, uh, because, of, because resistance was also civil war in Italy, and there were, uh, there's a <coughs> myth narrative that blames the partisans for not turning themselves in and saving the lives of the hostages which never was the case, and uh, it never happened. But this uh, narrative sort of poisons the memory of the resistance and everything. So this was the background. But, uh, and the facts were fairly clear. So clear, in fact, that it was too easy uh, for historians to write about them. Uh, you know, historians write about something which is difficult to reconstruct. Here, everything was clear. All you had to do was go to the archive and it was right there. Uh, except so that no historian ever wrote about it. So that the myth circulated unchallenged. Because the historians, and we're talking about the mid 90s, uh, did not realize that the important historical fact there was the memory. Uh, historians were not yet aware, you know, mainstream, mainline historians, or at least Italian mainstream, main, uh, mainstream historians were not very much aware of the fact that memory is a historical fact. So that everybody, everybody uh, praises me for uh, finding out how it actually happened. I didn't. Um, but nobody had bothered to tell the story before. So this was the background. But I wasn't really interested in, the, yes, setting the facts straight, of course. But uh, what fascinated me was the question of the survivors. Uh, partly because if you do oral history, it can be about uh, 1944, but it's of, in that case, 1997, 98, 99. And it's always about the interviewee. It's uh, no matter what uh, what historical context or event you're talking about, uh, the interviewee is it's always about the life of the person you're talking to. And, uh, and I had been intrigued at, the, at this rampant emotion going on, at this uh, uh, feeling that, um, at this uh, oxymoron, uh, elderly orphans. And I remember asking, um, a lady. Her name is Gabriella, Gabriella Polli. She's one of my heroines. And, uh, um, and I asked her, and she I said, uh, you know, they call you elderly orphans. Um, uh, how do you feel about it? And she says, of course, of course we are elderly orphans. Uh, it's like they cut off one of our legs and we put on a wooden leg, and we've been stumbling through life on that wooden leg for the last 50 years. It's now 70 years. So, uh, and this sense of orphanhood, yeah, uh, and how this traumatic event uh, has uh, reverberated through generations. One thing that Gabriella said, see how it is. He, she's talking about the head of the SS and, uh, and her father. He didn't just kill a man. He killed a man, a woman, and all the children with them. So the dead are not 335. Behind those dead, there are so many, so many more. So, uh, and a lot of the narrators were children back then. And, uh, um, and she went on to say, uh, not her, another woman. She said, uh, right after the end of the war, 
the transport authority gave us uh, survivors of the Fossil de Atene. They gave us a bunch every Sunday, you know, to go to the Fossil de Atene. To go, because uh, I'll, go, uh, I'll talk about this later. All the victims were buried on the place where they were killed. So it's, an, it's a huge, it's a cemetery, it's a shrine. And, and she says, on the bus, every Sunday, the same story. The mothers said that the wives couldn't understand the mother's sorrow. The wife said the mother couldn't understand the wife's sorrow. And I, and I remember that she, as she was saying this, she was looking up. And, that, and I, little and small, within me I wondered, what about the sorrow of the children? You know, and she was looking up just reconstructing the scene where she was this tall and, uh, and they were talking about above her head and she was talking about this. And, and what was my childhood, Gabriela says. When grandma would take me to see the caves and I said, Grandma, but where did Daddy die? Can you show me where? And she would say, he died in a hole. They put him inside that hole. And I couldn't figure that out. And the sense of fulfillment, I'll go back to this, when I saw his name on the list. And I mm -hmm. remember uh, all these women bent over those coffins, crying, and those children playing. She said, what was my childhood? Uh, other kids went to the park. We went to the Foster Detina and we played outside. Um, and I remember that I played with so many little girls there, little orphans like me. That was my childhood, going to the Foster Detina to play. Other children went to gardens, to parks, merry-go-rounds, and I went to the Foster Detina. Those were my Sunday islands. Then we grew up, she says, and, uh, and the day I got married, I went to the Foster Detina to put my bouquet on my father's grave. So, uh, this, this is uh, how the, um, the memory went down. Um, Esther Fano, Esther Fano is a, is a major economic historian t uh, today, and she says, uh, there was a, there was only, the, there wasn't only the risk of seeing what you should not see, because uh, uh, there was a constant danger of cave-ins. You know, now that the place has been sort of restored, but back then, when these children were going there, these were just holes in the ground, and um, and many of the bodies hadn't been identified yet. Or anyway, it was all this cof these coffins on the ground, and some of which were still open. And what was truly terrible was that all these families would go spend hours and hours there and fill these coffins with flowers. These flowers always rotted. And her brother also talks about this terrible stench you could smell all over the place, and which reminds me of uh, the stench of the body in uh, As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. Uh, and, and Esther says that, uh, I'll talk about this later, uh, of course she was, her father, they're Jewish, but her father had been um, uh, an army officer and he broke his sword when he was kicked out of the army for being Jewish. And so they were from a military family, they were middle class, they were proud, so they didn't cry. And, the only t and she only finally cried 10 years later. And she had a little, uh, number one, she can stand cut flowers. And uh, she cried when she had a little um, flower pot on her windowsill and for some reason it fell and it broke and then she finally cried over her father years later, because as uh, another woman told me, you know, there were two ways you, uh, in which you could grow up. One was you were obsessed by this discourse of the Fossil Bettini, of the massacre. Um, 
Elisabetta Nini says this, she's a lawyer, and she says, I grew up in this house where I was surrounded with mementos of my uncle, her uncle, um, and, uh, and my mother, my grandmother, that was all they talked about. So you grew up obsessed with this, or you grew up obsessed with the silence about it. Um, Esther Fano never talked to her children about it. In fact, uh, 50 years later, she had never told anyone, you know, as opposed to her brother, who was talk freely. But she had never mentioned this, and we were part of the same organization. And everything. We didn't know a thing. And I remember when the, the Spripka trial was going on, we were both members of the board of the Institute for the History of Resistance. And um, so somebody said, well, we as, a, as an institute, we should do something, some event, some, some, to talk about this trial, this case. This. And he said, of course, Anna and Esther should go. Incidentally, the only two Jewish people in the board. Because you know, the, this sense that it's sort of like the show. It's a private. It's a privatized memory, you know. Uh, and Esther and Anna says, "Of course not. This is not just a Jewish memory." And <coughs> Esther said, and you know, she shut shut us all. I can't because this guy Priebke killed my father, and we didn't know about it. She had never said anything. She she had never talked to her children who, in fact, are you know, seeing a, a psychoanalyst because they're very much aware